Okay, yes, I'm going to um, be slightly different and, and share my personal story, and it is a personal story. And over dinner last night, I met some amazing people, and we, I think we always often uh, enjoy those personal um, stories that we can all relate to, very often more than theoretical and all the academic stuff. So I hope you'll enjoy this. I've also got some fabulous pictures of Crete for you. <laughs> what about that? Because it's Friday. Now, um, can I just ask, is that, does this the next, is it? How do I click this? Yes, okay. Right, yes indeed, I ha I've had several change of hearts in my life, um, and about a month ago I turned a certain age, and I suspect I've got another change of heart coming, coming quite soon, <laughs> so I don't know what that will take, uh, where that will take me. Now, I left the electronics industry after 15 years, and a very senior role, so at 28 I had my first board position on a £70 million uh, company, and I went on to significantly larger TNCs working around the world. And in 2000, I had a moral um, dilemma about what the electronics industry was doing to the planet and to the people working for us. At that time, we had people dropping like flies. We had people dying of heart attacks through stress. We had 10% um, stress, irritable bowel syndrome problems in Chicago, New York, and the UK. And I was taking these issues to, um, to my board, and they were saying, well, don't be so silly, Sharon. That's the way business run. Come on, well, you know, what do you... What do you you know, strengthen up, girl, you know, really. You're a director of this, this corporation. You know how it works. You know how it is. And we were, sh we were lying to our shareholders. Anyway, I felt that eventually I couldn't give my business card to someone without feeling physically sick. I felt physically ill about the company I worked for. So I was in Chicago. One final straw, I resigned. I rang my husband from Chicago and said, darling, I've had it. 15 years, I've had it. And he said, come home, we'll have a cup of tea and we'll sort it all out. <laughs> Very British, my husband. <laughs> so we did. We had that cup of tea, and uh, and I decided uh, that this corporation, and actually not just that that electronics company, it was all of them. They were all exactly the same. It's two thousand. I never had heard of CSR, never heard of sustainability, but I have been doing quite a bit of teaching and um, developing businesses within the distributorship. So I went off to Tasmania. I went trekking. I went trekking in Nepal. I decided I was going to be running leadership development programs around the world, and I've done that for. Well, since 2000, effectively. So I guess you could say in some ways I've been a successful businesswoman. But over that period, I've really changed my style of, of being a business leader. When I left that corporation, I lost my identity. I lost my BMW. I lost my five-star hotel. I lost all my, my first-class travel. Who was I the next time I had a lovely dinner like last night? I was nobody. Who's going to talk to me? I'm not a top executive anymore. I found that really, really, really difficult. Harder than I thought, actually. So I had to kind of rebuild myself and I had a different style of leadership. My style of leadership was authoritative, command and control, impressing, all about impressing. And I probably spent most days going to work not being me. Do you ever have that feeling? Just not being me, just fitting in with the, the norms of that, that, that culture of that corporation. So I had to rebuild myself. So, taking people into the Tasmania, into the wilderness of, Ch of Chamonix and all around the world, I actually, as well as developing leaders, I developed myself as well. And I learned that actually, the way we give our sense, the way we receive sense from people, is a, uh, how we allow interpretation of leadership is far more important than the authoritative command and control. So really, the last 13 years, I've been de developing myself as a leader around those, those, uh, those issues. And the whole issue of the social identity. If the social identity of your corporation doesn't fit you and you don't fit it, get out like I did, frankly. And that's, that's one of the things that I talk about. So, this is the European Sustainability Academy in Crete. <laughs> and it's mine! <laughs> it really is mine. This is every penny I own in the world, frankly. <laughs> so, after several years of taking people to Tasmania, I had this vision. And I thought, you know, I really want to build a, a permanent, e fully ecological, off-grid building in a small community, centrally in the world, Tasmania is a long way away, somewhere access to the Middle East, European um, clientele. And I went to my husband, I said, darling, could we invest all our savings in doing this? And he went, have a cup of tea and we'll talk about it. <laughs> Amazing the power of a cup of tea in England. So uh, we did, and he did. And we opened our doors almost exactly one year ago today. This building is built purely of, of straw, uh, mud, wood, We've, we've recruited only local people in Crete, mostly women. The two women architects, 30 years old, design this. And they are getting in, um, inquiries from around the world now because of this building. This is the land before we built it. The remit was we don't cut down one tree, we don't knock down one rock. Look at those rocks. Would you knock those down? The Cretans would. They'd knock the whole flipping lot down. 
and then replant little, little trees. I just put that in because it's a nice photograph. <laughs> and that is behind... The, that is behind my academy. So when people are sitting out in the grounds and, and thinking about ethics and business, that's what they look at. We built the building with including people, the, the, the villagers. We've taught the villagers sustainable building uh, processes. We taught them you don't have to decimate an area before you build it. We taught about collaboration, stakeholder engagement. We had a party building this place. We were drinking wine, eating olives. It was just a fab music going. We were dancing sitaki around. It was a real party. This did not work. We taught people about green roofs. So through all the building process, we were, we were conducting lectures and workshops. It was a whole a working process. But what people say to me, Sharon, how did you get people involved? How have you got a little Cretan village involved in your academy? Why are they looking after you? Why do the women come down on their sticks to feed me? Sad on! They think I'm losing weight. God forbid. <laughs> they bring me a little packet of food. They bring me flowers in their garden. This is seriously happening. Jeremy, you saw but Marike. She came in the lecture and goes, Sad on, some flowers for you. Why are they doing that to me? Well, 18 months, I sat in the bar... <laughs> I sat in the Café Neon in the village with my laptop, with a mud brick, with the plans, and I was available to them. I did my new authenticity, my new emergence. So losing this kind of command and control, I've reached a new leadership which is allowing people to come to me in their own time, their own sense-making, their own interpretation. If I went there and said, we are going to do this, you're going to do that, I'd have a hundred sheep in my, my courtyard every single day and some <laughs> large um, earth-moving vehicles because they wouldn't want me. I'm an outsider. So I made myself very available and very honest to them. Two minutes, right. And as you can see that we, at the opening day, 200 people came from all across the region. And at this point, and those are my two architects, the lovely girls there, they're the two architects, um, Zeta and Tania. At this point, we said, how do you want to use this building? It's an academy for teaching, but it's in your village. They said, well, the kids need a, um, something to do. This room is used every month for the cinema for the kids, for free, it's my gift to them. People come, okay, this is actually us doing real work when Jem came to visit us last um, October. Uh, of course, we're running real management development programs there. And we let people use the place for parties, as my gift. So the return for, the, for me is they look after my building when I'm not there. They maintain it for me. Uh, the doors were left open for eight days and eight nights last year by mistake. Someone didn't shut the doors. The farmers watched my building for eight days and eight nights to make sure nothing happened in there. We've got thousands and thousands of equi uh, dollars of equipment in there. Last year, we put into the village 45,000 euros through bringing people through the academy, through using the Café Neons. You can see we have fun, look. This <laughs> is Gem's 40th, indeed it is. And we take all our visitors to the Café Neons to support the economy. Um, this, they don't do this for us as a, as a tourist thing. This is how life is in Drapanos. So you can imagine me bringing people from all around the world to this wonderful village uh, and being, they're being received in this very natural, sustainable way. We also work with um, social entrepreneurs and eco-entrepreneurs, and we bring local businesses into um, ESA to teach international people, and vice versa. It's a full, fully open exchange of, of, of knowledge and ideas. This Fisica is run by three fabulous women who've really struggled with this social entre enterprise, and we've helped them get their product established in, in different places across the world. And then we also do the more formal work with businesses like Panasonic and actually WWF, who also are supporters, in educating children across the region. And with Panasonic, we're actually rolling out a schools program across all the, the schools in Greece. We have ministry approval to do that. Now, I point out these things because none of those were in my business plan. They have emerged. People have come to me and said, this is what we need, Sharon. I still will run international uh, management training programs there. That's my business. All these extra things are far more fun. Far more fun. Everyone loves them. I'm going to skip through these because these are just words. <laughs> Pictures are always far more better, I think. Um, and all the things that emerged, I'm going to fi fi uh, finish now, all the things that emerged that I didn't think of, that I didn't control, have been enriched the whole experience of one year of, of setting up the European Sustainability Academy. And it's about me as a leader letting my hands off, off, off the control. And just very, very, very final, very personal comment, and I'm, I'm stopping, is I want to share that it, this is because in 2011 I burnt out. I completely crashed. I went to bed for two months and couldn't get up. I couldn't make a decision. I couldn't decide if I wanted tea or coffee. That, for me, was the most important thing that happened to me in my whole life. Because when I did get out of bed, I was a different person. I wasn't superwoman anymore. And since I stopped being superwoman, my life has become super. Thank you very much. Thank you.